The summer 2019 political season is underway and the first debates of the 2020 presidential cycle have just taken place. We get some political insight from Iowa journalists on this Reporters Roundtable edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Now celebrating more than 40 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa Public Television. This is the Friday, June 28 edition of Iowa Press. Here is David Yepsen. The 2020 Iowa caucuses are 220 days away, but the intensity on the ground here is growing. Candidates have engaged in the first round of televised debates and are returning to Iowa for Fourth of July parades and campaigning. But a presidential election is just part of the political backdrop here. To dive into the headlines with some journalistic insight, we've gathered a group of Iowa political reporters. Brianne Fonnensteel is chief political reporter for the Des Moines Register. James Lynch is political writer for the Gazette in Cedar Rapids. Dave Price is political director for WHO-TV in Des Moines and he hosts the Insiders program every Sunday morning. Thanks for that. And Kay Henderson is news director at Radio Iowa. Kay, let's uh, just go around the horn real quickly. Who did well in that debate? Well, I think the consensus on the Twitterverse and among the pundit class is that Kamala Harris cleaned up on uh, Thursday night and that Elizabeth Warren distinguished herself among the 10 uh, the previous night. I don't want to get too breathless about what's going on here. We're seven months out from the caucuses. And how many Iowa caucus goers spent four hours watching those debates? Conversely, the only thing that people who didn't watch the debates are seeing is the exchange between Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And so that's solidifying uh, an idea that Joe Biden may not have the chops to James. go the distance. Well, I think it's interesting, you know, a few weeks ago we had Ann Selzer on this program and she said Joe Biden's support looked shaky, I think was the word she used. And certainly last night he looked a little bit shaky in that debate. And, he, and I mean, he had to know that everybody was gunning for him. I mean, he's the presumptive front runner. Uh, and so he should have expected those attacks. And it seemed like he was not prepared to respond uh, with the same intensity as those who were questioning his long, long record in public service. Brian, what does this debate mean for the Iowa process? How did, how did, uh, what did, what did you think of the debate? But any, any thoughts about what it may or may not mean for what's happening here? Well, I think one thing that kind of gets lost among people like us, we've been super tuned in for a long time, but for a lot of Iowans, this is the first time that they're seeing all of these candidates lined up. They're seeing some of these candidates speak for the first time. And so it's really an introduction for a lot of people. So they're seeing people like Cory Booker really make his case. They're seeing people like Julian Castro make his case. But to the point about Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and, and our Ann Selzer poll most recently, what really struck me about the way this is going to affect Iowans is a lot of people told us that Kamala Harris is their favorite second choice candidate. So while she's a polling a little bit lower in the race, a lot of people said she's on our radar, we want to see more, and I have to think that this debate performance helps her. Dave, what's your take? Who did well? What's it mean for the race in Iowa? And to Brianne's point, also in your same poll by Cory Booker was at least in the conversation, right? And his, his tactic, it seemed like, on that first debate night was not to get nasty, and that's kind of his thing, civility. And he could be a little bit aspirational. He didn't really engage a lot necessarily with the other candidates around him, but still sort of stood out. And Elizabeth Warren, like you mentioned, right there on policy, she does it very succinctly, came out, no big gaffes or anything like that, so she comes out of there clearly without a moment like Julian Castro and Beto O'Rourke had, where Castro went his after his fellow Texans so hard on immigration and O'Rourke was kind of back on his heels a little bit and really got chewed up, obviously not as badly as Joe Biden, who
who was frankly, it was sort of stunning how ill prepared he was for that exchange with Kamala Harris about busing. How was he not ready for that? Whether he personally wasn't prepped, his staff didn't prep him, whatever it was, but it was amazing how he just put his head down and let her just take him apart. The, the, other, the other part about um, the debate that I think is important is that um, they're playing to a Democratic audience, but the Trump folks are going to really flog them on what they did on immigration. I've heard it from Republicans already here on the ground that they can't believe some of the things that they said in regards to immigration during both nights of the debate, and Trump will really fillet them on that. Dave, um, talk a little bit about television. Uh, the point was made here a moment ago about a lot, of, most people don't watch the whole thing, but they do see the clips that you folks choose to air on the 10 p.m. news. Uh, is that right? How Any numbers? Oh, uh, totally. I totally agree with what she's saying, both on the news, but everybody, almost everybody's doing video these days, right? And those little exchanges, because you do wonder how many people watched literally every second of four hours of, <laughs> of coverage. It was hard enough for us to, to find the time to do that. But so those little moments and those little exchanges. So if you're not really paying attention, you have no clue who Julian Castro is. You noticed his Google searches went up. Even Tulsi Gabbard had some after her exchange where she really put Tim Ryan in his place on who was responsible for the 9-11 attacks. But it was a great moment for people to have that opportunity to get in a bunch of get in a bunch of people's faces and then even if it's just a 15 30 second exchange through social media or on TV or from a paper website whatever it was radio that's your moment to introduce yourself well okay. and, and and for Joe Biden what's his video clip going to be i mean right. from, from that debate what what is he going to want to share his best clip was when he had that little meme about bernie sanders hand flipping yeah. in front of his face and he's like Ugh. the the other question i have is is you know it goes to that second choice thing for kamala harris is she going to pick up support and is it going to going to come from joe biden's expense at his expense or is she picking it up from other folks kind of on the progressive wing of that stage. So I think that's going to be interesting to watch where her numbers come from. Brianne, dive back into the polls a little bit. Give us a handicap mm -hmm. of, of this race in Iowa now. So we polled um, Iowa at the start of June, and so we saw that Joe Biden, just like he is in almost every other poll, is at the top. He's polling at about 24 percent in Iowa of people saying that he's their first choice for president. Bernie Sanders is in second place at 16 percent, Elizabeth Warren at 15, and Pete Buttigieg at 14. Kamala Harris is the closest to cracking that, um, that double-digit number at 7 percent. But then we've got 14 people who are at 1% um, or below. So we've got a lot of people who are really at the bottom, kind of struggling to crack through this massive field. It's interesting that four years ago at this time in the Republican race, Donald Trump was at 1%. Exactly. So we have to be a little careful about being too dismissive of anybody. At, at exactly. This point. You know, you have to pay attention to everyone, and you look, um, you see the reverse. I mean, Beto O'Rourke, the first time we polled on him was at 11 percent. There were a lot of people who were really excited, and now he's down at 2 percent. And the same is true, and in, in the reverse, Pete Buttigieg has had a, a meteoric rise here in Iowa. Okay. What's your handicap of this race? Well, there appear to be tears developing and we really saw that at the hall of fame dinner earlier in june in cedar rapids um, it seemed as if some people were getting a little nervous and outright um, i guess annoyed that some of these people are still in the race hmm. Um, they didn't get a great reception yeah, from the, the right? right yeah, exactly <laughs> we're talking about activists it's a room full of activists many of whom have paid to be in the room uh, some of whom are the guests of a particular campaign. A and there was a real lack of enthusiasm for some of the lower tier candidates. And, you know, sort of those thought bubbles over the, over the tables. Why are you talking? James, how do you see the horse race? It's, it's interesting. After the Hall of Fame event, I heard people say, you know, I had, I had eliminated this person and this person, but after seeing them, I put them back on my list. I think the debate had the opposite effect. I think... Other than maybe like Julian Castro, who had a really strong performance the first night, I think it's more clear to people watching the debate there are some people who should be on the stage and some people who shouldn't be on the stage, who don't really belong there. And I think, and maybe some of the candidates got that message too, you know, if they go back and, and, and actually look at, you know, their performance and uh, their answers, they'll, you know, 
winnow the field, they'll self-winnow. Dave, how do you segment the race? Is it developing into tiers of candidates or lanes of candidates? It does, I, I suppose we could say more broadly, we have three tiers here, right? And we, I think just if we wanna oversimplify what we saw in those four hours of coverage, you can see those different tiers forming. Anybody who had almost no support in your poll and some of these national polls, and they were looking so hard to try to have that moment where they wanted to interject, and I'm thinking of John Delaney, who may have made some points when he was talking about the differences on health care, but then the rest of the debate kept trying to get in there and at some point was just sort of shushed away by the moderators at some point. Eric Swalwell decided he was going to go hard after Biden it, on passing the torch. He tried, it didn't really connect. He tried to go after Buttigieg too with the incident, uh, with the fatal shooting in South Bend. It's, it's hard to find your, your time. Gillibrand was trying, it's how do you, you know, the timing, where to insert yourself and with whom to engage to have your moment. But the caveat here is, unless your money dries up, these candidates are not going to, dry, to drop out. Even if they're not on the debate stage in September, they're still probably going to limp along until Iowa, unless they run into a Scott Walker problem and they burn through the cash and they have nothing left in the tank. James, do you expect to see some of these candidates have their money dry up as a result of a poor performance in the debate? It, it certainly will have an effect for some of them. And I think the, the bigger effect will be the debate rules, the eligibility rules for the September debates where they have to have uh, 130,000 donor, donors from, I think, 20 states. Um, and it was only 65,000 for this round of debates. So, you know, the people who barely met those eligibility rules really have a tough uh, challenge in front of them, and, and I think there will be some people who won't meet that challenge. Rand, I thought this format was awful, hmm. but I can't think of a better way to do it. Uh, hmm. Is there some way that, that these events could be done that is a little more dignified and presidential instead of a food fight, as Senator Harris said? What do you think? Well, you've got uh, Governor Jay Inslee pushing for an issue-focused debate. He's he's specifically advocating for a debate on climate change, where the whole, you know, the whole hour, two hours can be devoted to one issue and really digging into something like that. I, you know, I think we saw that a little bit in this debate, where they got into some of the issues around health care, for instance, and Medicare for all, and we saw the exchanges between some of the candidates, but didn't get as much substance as maybe we would have liked. Didn't hear from as many candidates as we would have liked. So I think you're going to see Jay Inslee continue pushing for something like that but I mean it's hard when there are 20 candidates on the stage and that's not even every candidate in the race but well, conversely the reason that Donald Trump won the nomination was because he was in he was willing to throw food rhetorically at his competitors and Republicans liked that Democrats this time around that you talk to the, the voters who are going to be uh, participating in the caucuses they're looking for someone who can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Trump and so that is part of why that dynamic was, was seen in that debate. One of the reactions I heard after the debate last night was, I was talking to somebody about Joe Biden having a poor night, and, and the response was, I really don't care. He's still the most electable. He's the only one who can beat Donald Trump. And, and I think that's maybe the strongest thing he has going for him and the toughest sort of toughest thing that other candidates have to break through. And electability is an issue that we could spend hours talking about what it actually means, but for a lot of uh, voters, that's going to be the main issue, is who can beat Donald Trump? In the eye of the beholder. Well, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, it, 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 it is true that an American president leads through the medium of television. That's been Ronald Reagan, John Kennedy proved that. So maybe having a televised food fight is, is the way to go. But I, it, it, it seems like you could take the 20 candidates in, in four hours and give them each 12 minutes <laughs> to, to just talk to the American people and you might better serve the voters. Well, we are seeing the DNC, I mean, in limiting and increasing its threshold to get onto the debate stage in September, I mean, we could be seeing seven or eight candidates on a stage. And so that pre presents kind of a different problem because here in Iowa, we really pride ourselves on giving everyone a platform and allowing people to break through the noise. But these, these rule changes are really changing the dynamic of who can compete. And we'll measure progress. Mm -hmm. It'll force them to progress or they're out. Yeah. 
and, and the purpose of a political party is to elect a candidate, not stage debates. Exactly. Okay, what, what's the lineup look like in Iowa? Uh, uh, there's been some talk that Iowa's place in these, this campaign is being diminished. This, this debate occurred in Miami. Well, that was a choice that the DNC made. There will be a debate in Iowa right before the caucuses. Um, secondly, what you're going to see here in the next few days is just a flood of candidates coming through over the Independence holiday trying to connect with Iowans. And, you know, hindsight is a great thing. <laughs> and I was thinking back to, you know, a, a few Fourth of July holidays that I've covered over the years. And the one that really stands out to me is 2007. It was the first instance in which Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton were going to be campaigning together. And the Obama campaign did not cede that ground. They came out and campaigned in Iowa. They did an event in Pella, which on its face seems weird because Pella is not a Democratic stronghold. But it was iconic. Um, it got huge play on the cables. And huge turnout. And huge turnout. And he did some event, he did an event in Beaverdale, and he also went to the Iowa Cubs game that evening. And it was clear that, that Obama knew that you have to campaign all across the state and get support even in places like Pella. And number two, I'm not giving up Iowa ground to the Clinton team. Dave, is Iowa's role in this presidential nominating process being diminished? I don't know if it's diminished or perhaps just a little different when you have, it depends how you do your math here, and <laughs> if you want to say 24 candidates or if you consider Mike Gravel, the former Alaska senator, a legitimate candidate, which seems to be a stretch, perhaps we have 25 here. That's a big, that's such a huge amount, right? So, and the way California has moved up its early voting to push up against us here. Are we really diminished or do we just have so many candidates and they're going to kind of spread out all over the country picking different states and perhaps giving a little more attention to some of these other states early on? Does that really take away what it is? But maybe at the end of the day, do you not need the historical three to you know, be one of the top three in this state or are we talking about five or six? Yeah. First class coach and standby. Yeah, I don't know what comes tickets. four, five, and six. Then but. there's baggage. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and right. Stowaway. Cargo. Underneath, yeah, exactly. Cargo, right. Grant, what's your thought about this? Is Iowa is Iowa's role in this process to diminished? Well, I'll throw out a stat that we've been tracking at the Des Moines Register. We've had 600 candidate appearances in Iowa since the start of this year. So that to me does not sound like a diminished role. But um, to Dave's point, I do agree that maybe it's changed a little bit. And I think you're seeing um, you know, a greater importance perhaps on the winnowing effect on kind of vetting these candidates early because there are so many. Um, but, you know, you are seeing people prioritize. We have so many candidates that, you know, it does not always make sense to be one of 15 people in the state at a time. Maybe you get better TV player if you're in South Carolina. Maybe it fits into your strategy differently. But I don't think we're seeing the diminished effect that people were um, lamenting early the, on. The other way to measure this is, you know, we have three major campaigns that have a huge paid presence in the state. Booker and Warren, prior to Memorial Day, had huge staffs between them, more than 100 people on the ground. And Harris uh, announced right before the Hall of Fame event that she was staffing up, so to speak, and seemed to be making the idea that she's going to make a big play here in Iowa. As, in contrast to the efforts they've been making in South Carolina, mm -hmm. which they're sensitive to because some folks here have been pushing back at, are you trying to play here or are you focused elsewhere? Uh, the other thing, David, is that, you know, 200 and some days until the caucuses, um, you know, you referenced that uh, Trump was at 1%. I think Bernie Sanders was at 3% in Iowa early on uh, last cycle. So there's a lot of time for somebody to catch fire, for an issue to come up that we aren't talking about today, that they've got the answer and all of a sudden, you know, people are saying like, oh, yeah. She has the right answer. She's really on top of this. So I, I think those sorts of things are still in play. There are issues, you know, there's a lot of time for things to develop in the news that change how we judge these candidates and, and what we expect from them. So I, I, I mean, while we talk about winnowing the field, there's still time for, you know, the one percenters to suddenly jump to double digits and, and be, you know, uh, taken seriously. And James, could that not enhance the importance of Iowa. I mean, the only way a candidate is going to campaign in California is through media attention. Right. And the place you get that is here. So 
maybe the Jimmy Carter model still works. Somebody comes out of nowhere in Iowa. I think it's still possible, and I, and I think it's I think it's important for any candidate to do well here so they can do well in California. And that, that primary on that Super Tuesday where Texas and California and other states are, are voting um, is going to be a major importance in, in winning the nomination. And both of those states have two home state candidates right. who should have a huge advantage there, right? But I think those early early polls would show that they don't yet at this but point. But I, I think... You know, we, we talk a lot about California and South Carolina and whether that's, um, you know, infringing on Iowa's place. But more than them, I think it's this viral Internet. You know, it's cable TV. These candidates are looking for ways to, to be viral, to stand out online. We saw Pete Buttigieg rise from nothing, and that wasn't because he was playing here in Iowa. That was because he had a moment that caught fire and spread through the Internet. So I think more than that, we're just seeing, you know, the media landscape change, and that's affecting the way that people play. Dave, uh, you folks at WHO had Governor Steve Bullock uh, on uh, at a town meeting just a, in advance of the first debate. How'd that work? Did he, he was excluded from the debates. Right. Uh, raised a fuss about it. I wonder, did he, didn't he get more media attention by being excluded than, uh, than included? You would think so. He did one with us on the first night of the debate on Wednesday. We had the debate was at 8 o'clock Iowa time. We had him on from 4 to about 4.40. Then the next day, in fact, that night, he flew to Boston and then drove. He was telling me he was going to get to New Hampshire at like 2 o'clock in the morning, had an early morning hit on Morning Joe on MSNBC, I think. And then he taped another town hall at uh, the, uh, one of the affiliates in New Hampshire. So he tried to use that play, contrast him with like Seth Moulton, who also didn't, didn't make it in there, the Massachusetts congressman. He tried to do interviews for Miami or whatever. And you wonder what kind of splash do you really get from that? So Bullock, we did a little in-house town hall with him, had about a dozen undecideds. Obviously people on TV got to see him, but it was, he got to do this, the engagement up close, a lot of these people had no idea very much about Steve Bullock, but all walked away, all the ones I talked to walked away liking the conversation and at least would consider him. Yeah. James, uh, we've got a few minutes left. Let's switch gears to the Republican Party. Uh, I'm struck by all these Republicans showing up in Iowa. Has the 2024 Republican presidential campaign started in Iowa? Well, you know, does the campaign ever stop in <laughs> Iowa? It, it's continuous. But yes, it has begun, uh, you know, pretty low level. But I think, you know, we've got an event, the uh, family leader event coming up this summer where uh, Senator Tim Scott, uh, Jim Langford, uh, Tom Cotton, uh, Ben Sass are all going to be there. Um, these are folks on the conservative wing of the Republican Party. Uh, and with Joni Ernst running for re-election, I think we're going to see a lot of Republicans coming for their friend Joni to campaign. And, and we're certainly seeing the fundraising appeals from Marco Rubio and, and all her Republican colleagues. So, yeah, I think people are, you know, they just want their name to be known. They want to be recognized when they come to Iowa. And, and we'll see more of it. And former U.N. Ambassador Nikki Haley was here for the Joni Ernst Roast and Ride and delivered a speech that seems as if it's the framework for her 2024 campaign. Well, the family leader, a group of social conservatives, it's headed by Bob Vanderplatz. Uh, that's a pretty good audience for a Republican to be in front of, right, Grant? Absolutely, and I think you're going to see more and more people over over the years ahead. But, you know, in talking with Democrats and Republicans, they say, we remember who's come here. We, if we've seen you for the last four or eight years when you weren't running, that means something to us when you are running. And, Dave, uh, we've overlooked uh, Mike Pence, who, as I see it, managed to visit the same flood twice. <laughs> yes. Is he thinking about 2024? You don't think he was just thinking about the Iowans impacted? I'm sure he was. <laughs> But it helps to have a couple of moments here, right, when we're in crisis and he got to be there talking to people. The cameras are all surrounding him. And, yes, as you point out, he did come twice as he perhaps looks at the landscape ahead. Um, talk a little bit about, uh, Joan, we've got just a couple minutes left. And, uh, uh, Kay, Joni Ernst announced. Mm -hmm. What's her message? She is using a message that is very much aligned with the message that President Trump is delivering right now. She's hammering at Democrats as being the party of socialists. Um, she has a group of Democrats who have emerged 
three of them. I'm not going to mention all their names. And then another one may be waiting in the wings and maybe another one who ran for Congress who may at some point decide whether he's running for the U.S. Senate. Um, but it was striking that she really is tacking toward Trump and very um, well received by those base voters that turned out for her uh, kickoff event. Dave, less than a minute. What's the mood of the Iowa electorate right now? Uh, I think it's it's stayed the same in a lot of ways. You look at Trump's numbers, they, they are the same as they've always been, right? I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that's been going on since he's been president, and we have this trade war, we have the tariffs, we, we have disaster here, all kinds of things, investigations right and left, but his numbers are what they are, and they don't seem to change, and it seems like people's mood doesn't change much. He, he's not gaining, he's not really losing. It just, it is what it is. If you cheer for the Cyclones, you don't change and cheer for the Hawkeyes. <laughs> all right. We have to leave it at that. We're out of time. Thanks to all of you. We we'll look forward to having you back. And thank you for joining us. We'll be back next week for another edition of Iowa Press at our regular times, 7.30 Friday night, noon on Sunday, and anytime at IPTV.org. So for all of us here at Iowa Public Television, I'm David Yepsen, and thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa Bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks.